Well, let me explain a couple of things. As uh, a lot of you know, uh, I have a book coming out, and uh, the name of the book <laughs> is uh, The Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss, My Life with Terence McKenna, uh, is the subtitle. And as you know, I'm Terence's brother. Uh, and uh, we shared uh, many interests and, uh, and ideas and adventures over the years. And Terence has told his story, mostly in true hallucinations. Uh, if you, any of you are familiar with that book, that's sort of his narrative of our trip to the Amazon in 1971. Uh, we had a lot of uh, passion uh, about, and we were in search of exotic uh, orally active forms of DMT, and uh, we stumbled on a paper by Ari Schultes about varola as an orally active uh, form of DMT, which we uh, I talked about this morning, the ukuhe. We thought that must have been the holy grail, and so that's what focused us and determined that we would go to La Chirera. Well, when we got to La Chirera, the objective to find ukuhe um, sort of got shoved aside when we found that La Chirera was in the middle of about 300 acres of pastures in which they had Cebu cattle and there were huge big clusters of psilocybin psilocybe cubensis mushrooms growing out of every cow pie. And uh, we kind of got into that as a recreational thing initially uh, while we were waiting for the real mystery but it, it quickly emerged that the mushrooms were the, the real mystery. And we got into some very, very, very peculiar cognitive places, uh, which I'm not going to talk about today, <laughs> actually, <laughs> because it's too complicated. I was going to talk about what is known in, I guess, the annals of psychedelic uh, literature, uh, the community as the experiment at La Chirera. And it's discussed in the book. By the way, I should mention, why did I call it the Brotherhood of the Screaming Abyss? Well, it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek thing at the time. I mean, both Terry and I, Terrence and I, were both Irish, and, you know, obviously, in the same family. And we had uh, kind of a sense of humor about what we were doing. We took ourselves very seriously when we went down there, but at the same time, not so seriously. And... and uh, you know, we grew up in, with science fiction, and uh, we were fans of H.P. Lovecraft. If you know H.P. Lovecraft, the horror writer from the 20s, and he was always talking about, you know, the gibbering horror from beyond the stars, the screaming abysses of unimaginable, you know, all this stuff. So we were kind of steeped in that, in a sense. So when we went down to the Amazon, we said, we are, you know, we're the brotherhood of the screaming abyss. And I chose that for the title of the book. Well, we had no idea, right, how much of an abyss we would plumb. But um, the sections that talk, the sections in my book that talk about this are kind of long, and uh, there's, you kind of have to lay the uh, groundwork of what we were doing. You have to kind of explain what was going on. That takes a long time, and then I was going to unpack it. So I decided not to talk about that because our time is limited today. What I am going to talk about is flash forward from 1971 uh, to 1991. And at that time, the screaming abyss was well behind us. Uh, and I was working uh, as a research pharmacologist at a, a startup company in California called, appropriately enough, Shaman Pharmaceuticals. And, and it was a drug discovery company, not ethnobotany-driven drug discovery company, not interested in psychoactives per se, but interested in plumbing the sort of the biodiversity of the rainforest to find new medicines for uh, various applications. And so I was working there, and I had published my thesis work on ayahuasca at that time, and so I had some credibility in the field. And uh, so I received out of the blue at this time an invitation from the UDV, which is the Brazilian church, uh, one of the syncretic churches that uses ayahuasca ceremonially. And they invited me to a conference they were holding in Sao Paulo uh, that summer. 
they wanted me to present, and uh, they invited a number of other people involved in the in the ayahuasca field at that time, and uh, they uh, you know asked us to come and present our research. So I was there. I was probably the only ethnopharmacologist, but I was there with a number of physicians and uh, you know ethnobotanists and uh, anthropologists and uh, uh, you know, people from various disciplines, and we all gave talks, right? Turned out that what was really going on with their organizing of this conference was uh, they had an agenda with the uh, Brazilian uh, drug regulatory authorities, the uh, organization called CONFEN, to get approval for their use of ayahuasca in a religious context. And there was consideration in the government at that time to prohibit this. They wanted to bring a bunch of people from outside, so-called experts, and have a big conference and impress the regulatory authorities. And uh, uh, to say, well, this isn't really a drug of abuse. This is not a problem. So they held this conference. So it had as much of a sort of political subtext as it did a scientific subtext. So I went down and we had, uh, you know, a very stimulating two or three days like this day's many PowerPoint presentations and talks and uh, a lot of discussions in the corridors and that sort of thing at one of the UDV temples outside um, Sao Paulo. And there were, oh, maybe a couple of hundred people uh, that attended this, mostly members of, of the UDV. And, uh, and then at the end of the conference, as the sort of uh, f final climax of the conference, they had organized a group session of ayahuasca for uh, everyone. The, the visitors, the dignitaries, it was very strange to think of myself as a dignitary, but I guess I was, along with the others and uh, many of the local uh, members of the UDV church. So we, at the end of the conference, we all gathered in this temple to take ayahuasca and there was about 500 people uh, in this session. And when I was, when we took it, we were all, we foreigners were all down front. I don't know if you've been to Brazil or seen how it's organized, but these temples are circular and they have uh, tiers, they have tiers of uh, steps on uh, the inside and there are chairs arrayed in these, in a circle around the central table where the mestres are, the, the mestres who are administering the ayahuasca. So we were down toward the front, kind of. And uh, when, I, when I took this journey uh, with the UDV, I had limited experience uh, with uh, ayahuasca. Uh, I had been to Peru. Uh, I had done my research on it, but I wasn't really uh, that familiar with it. Uh, and I had a very uh, profound uh, experience with ayahuasca at that time. It, you might call it the biochemist nerds uh, inside uh, tour of photosynthesis, which we were talking about yesterday. <laughs> so uh, back at the conference after three days of PowerPoints and roundtables at a UDV temple on the outskirts of Sao Paulo. The event culminated in an ayahuasca ceremony with the foreign dignitaries of the guests of honor. About 500 people put, took part in that ceremony. I had a profound visionary revelation in which I experienced photosyn photosynthesis from a molecule's eye view and understood the importance of this everyday miracle for the sustenance of life on this planet. It was a cathartic and moving experience, one of my most profound ayahuasca journeys. The following account of my lessons from the teacher has been adapted from an earlier version that appeared in Ayahuasca Reader, Encounters with the Sacred Vine. And in light of our discussions yesterday about photosynthesis and its importance and some of the beautiful testimony that people gave this morning, I thought this was maybe an appropriate thing to, uh, to talk about. Um, Okay, so on the night in question, the weather was humid and balmy. In the gathering dusk, we all walked the short distance from the dormitories where we had been staying to the temple, nestled in a small valley about a quarter mile away. In the center of the amphitheater-like space, a long table was arranged with chairs arrayed around and a picture of Mr. Gabriel, the UDV founder and prophet. 
hung beneath an arch-shaped structure decorated with the sun, moon, and stars at one end. Several gallons of wasca tea, the, a brownish liquid the color of cafe latte, was in a plastic juice dispenser placed on the table beneath the picture of Mr. Gabriel. Beside it was a stack of paper picnic cups. A special set of chairs had been reserved for the visiting dignitaries along one of the terrace-like elevations close to the center of the amphitheater. We threaded our way along the members, among the members already seated and took our places in the reserved spot. After everyone had gotten settled, the mestre in charge rose to start dispensing the brew, helped by a couple of acolytes. The members formed an orderly line, and one by one we filed down to stand before the mestre and be handed a paper cup containing our allotted draught. The size of the servings varied from person to person and seemed to be measured according to body weight and the mestre's assessing gaze. One got the feeling that he was taking the measure of the soul and spirit of the supplicant standing before him. Each person took their cup and returned to stand in front of the, their chair. Once everyone had been served, the mestre gave a signal and all raised the cups to their lips and drained the bitter, foul-tasting beverage in two or three gulps. One of the Brazilian scientists standing beside me slipped me a small piece of ginger to chew to kill the aftertaste. I was grateful for the kind gesture. Having drained their cups, everyone sat back in their comfortable webbed chairs. I kept hoping someone would turn off the glaring, buzzing, fluorescent lights overhead that were altogether too bright and quite annoying. They were to stay on during the entire evening, however. For about 45 minutes, everyone sat absorbed in their own thoughts. The crowded hall was absolutely silent. After this period, a few people began to get up and totter toward the bathrooms as the nausea, a frequent side effect of the early stages, began to take hold. About the same time, the mestre began singing a beautiful song called the Shamana, Shamada, and though I could not understand the Portuguese words, the melody was quite moving. The sound of the heartfelt shamada mingling with the retching, gasping noises of people throwing up violently in the background made me stump mild at the incongruity, but no one else seemed to notice. My own experience was not developing, as I'd hoped. My stomach was queasy, but not enough to send me to the bathroom, and I felt restless and uncomfortable. I felt very little effect, except for some brief flashes of hypnagogia behind my closed eyes. I was disappointed. I had been hoping for more than a sub-threshold experience. When the mestre signaled that he was ready to give a second glass to anyone who wanted it, I was among the group of about a dozen gringos that queued up in front of his table. Apparently, I was not the only one who was having a difficult time connecting to the spirit of the tea. I took my second drink and settled back into my chair. It tasted as, if possible, even worse than the first one had. Within a few minutes, it became clear that this time it was going to work. I began to feel the force of the waska course through my body, a feeling of energy passing from the base of my spine to the top of my head. It was like being born upwards in a high-speed elevator. I welcomed the sensation as confirmation that the train was pulling out of the station. The energized feeling and the sensation of rapid, of rapid acceleration continued. It was much like mushrooms, but seemed to be much stronger. I had the sense that this was one elevator it would be hard to exit before reaching the top floor, wherever that might be. Random snippets of topics we had been discussing at the seminars in the previous days began to float into my consciousness. I remembered one seminar that had addressed the UDV's concept that the power of waska tea is a combination of force and light. The force was supplied by the MAO inhibiting Banisteriopsis vine, known as Mariri in the local vernacular, while the light, the visionary hypnagogic component, was derived from Chakuna, the DMT containing Psychotria admixture plant. I thought to myself, what an apt characterization this was. Waska was definitely a combination of force and light, and at that moment I was well within the grip of the force and hoped that I was about to break into the light. At that instant I had that thought, 
I heard a voice seeming to come from behind my left shoulder. It said something like, you want to see force? I'll show you force. 